Thank you, Councillor, and thanks for that wonderful welcome earlier today and in the keeping with the spirit of the day, in my father's language, Baladu Wiradjuri Gibia, Dira Maralinya Badu Wiradjuri Nadu Yindyamara Mayanji Nina Gare Niani Burgali Nura Nina Yaradu. From Wiradjuri people to the Burundjuri people, our respect and thanks for having me here today. And thank you for that great introduction. Um, it was wonderful before I was led down here to speak, I got to meet some of the people who are working here, and uh, as we do, you know, within a couple of minutes, I've worked out that I was related to about two or three of them. <laughs> <coughs> you can find family no matter where you are. Then I walked in, there's another one of my cousins sitting over here who uh, came up for a photo. Oh, you're uh, Auntie Lola's great-grandson, uh, great-great-great-grand-nephew. So it's amazing, you know, the connections that we have all over the country. And I was really heartened to see the people that I met this morning and the work that's being done in the council and the, the way that the Reconciliation Action Plan is creating opportunities. And I was talking about when I first came into journalism and, uh, you know, there was no one else, you know, I <laughs> sort of stumbled, you know, into this utterly alien environment and incredibly um, sexist, racist places. I mean, newsrooms were hard going. They still are hard going, but not like this. And I was saying to them, whenever you did anything right in the newsroom, they would always say, oh, good on you, you're a white man. That was the, that was the form of compliment, you're, you're a white man. So I did get called a white man quite a few times when I was started out in journalism. But look, I, I really want to talk to you today about this theme of Reconciliation Week, this idea that don't make history a mystery. And I've been grappling with this concept of history and what it tells us and how it is used, who gets to write history, who gets to tell us what the story of us is. And it is treacherous terrain. And just this week I've gone back much further, in fact, than just looking at Australia and Australians' experience, but I've tried to locate this in a much more global framework because the question of history and the questions of identity that arise out of history are in many ways the single biggest challenge that our world faces today. And I've gone back to a French historian and philosopher and what he could tell us about reconciliation between black and white in Australia, who more than a century ago, when Australia, we still presumed that Aboriginal people were a dying race, Ernest Renan was wrestling with this question, it's a fundamental question. What is a nation? What is a nation? It remains one of the most profound and powerful statements of identity, I think, ever written. He wrote it in 1882 in the shadows of the French Revolution just a few years earlier. Renan said that he sought to look beyond what he called the grave errors of race or language or religion. He came to his essay, he wrote, in an absolutely cold and impartial fashion. A nation, he wrote, was defined not by any one thing, but by the sum of its many parts, the fusion of the populations that comprise them. Race, he said, could be no foundation for nationhood. To Renan, and remember this is 1882, to Renan there are no pure races. Race, he said, has always been of diminishing importance. No one, he wrote, has the right to go about the world examining men's heads and then grabbing them by the throat and saying, you are of our blood. You belong to us. The nation, he wrote, was a daily referendum, a perpetual affirmation of life, the search for a collective identity. Renan wrote that a nation is a soul, a spiritual principle. It was born of a marriage of the past and the present. One, the past, the possession of a rich trove of memories. The other, the present, the actual consent, the desire to live together, the will to continue to value the undivided, shared heritage. Critical to Renan was the question of history. History could bind a nation or tear it apart. The study of history, he wrote, often poses a threat to nationality. Renan then laid a challenge to us that resonates still today. Forgetting, he said, 
I could even say historical error is an essential factor in the creation of a nation. To hear those words today, it's almost the antithesis of what we think today when we look at history as a roadmap to our present. But we do it all the time. We forget, we choose those aspects of our history that we believe tell us most about ourselves. Why do we celebrate Anzac Day over many other battles? Why do we erect monuments to certain figures? Why do we not tell other stories about ourselves? Because it doesn't fit a narrative. Forgetting is crucial to nationhood. It is, as I say, a challenge to our age. Do we endlessly prosecute grievance or do we set aside the past to find true unity? Today, history can often be used as a weapon. We define ourselves and divide ourselves along historical lines. History is to identity what carbon is to steel. The journalist and philosopher David Riff was inspired by Renan for his 2017 book, In Praise of Forgetting. I would urge anyone to read it. It's been one of the most confronting but profound books I've read in recent times. And Reef approached that old adage that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it, and he turned it on its head. Instead, he wrote, thinking about history is far more likely to paralyse than encourage. To Reef, we risk turning it into a formula for unending grievance and vendetta. Unending grievance and vendetta. Now, I've spent 30 years as a journalist, almost two decades of that outside of Australia. And we often call journalism the front row seat of history. And I've seen the world turn. I've seen the return of division and borders and hatred along ideological, political, and religious, and racial lines. And I know that the great conflicts of our world have at their core this unending grievance, this failure to reconcile that's so often rooted not just in our history, but how we perceive our history. Think of the conflicts that have scarred our world and how they are born out of these wounds of the past. Catholic versus Protestant, Hutu against Tutsi in Rwanda, Shia and Sunni, Hindu pitted against Muslim, Israeli versus Palestinian. Seslav Milos, the Polish Nobel Prize winning poet, once said, perhaps there are no memories, but the memories of wounds. The Indian philosopher and economist Amartya Sen calls these identities solitarist identities. They are exclusive. They divide the world into us and them. Identity, he says, at its worst, can kill. There is a difference, of course, between identity that nourishes us and the need for identity, which is crucial. I walk through the world as an Indigenous Australian, as a Wiradjuri person, a Gamaroy person, a person too of Irish heritage, an Australian. All of those things make up who I am. And those things provide the contours of my life. Identity at its best can be an extraordinarily uplifting and inspiring thing, but at its worst, as we've seen, it can kill. And we have witnessed now the rise of what's become known as identity politics, a political tribalism that has infected both the left and the right of politics. It is instinctive. It's hardwired. A tribalism that leads us to cling to our own and reject those deemed as outsiders. It is a 21st century law of the jungle. Look around our world right now. This was meant to be the end of history. In 1989, the political scientist Francis Fukuyama, when he saw the Berlin Wall coming down and an end to the Cold War, said that Western democratic liberalism had triumphed. 
that this was the end of the great ideological battles. Indeed, he called it the end of history. What we have seen instead is the return of history. We are putting up new walls. We are militarising our borders. We are shutting down debate. The politics of identity is winning at the ballot box. The strong man is back. Erdogan in Turkey, Orban in Hungary, Duterte in the Philippines, Sisi in Egypt, Putin in Russia, Xi Jinping in China, and of course, in his own way, Donald Trump, each riding a wave of resurgent populism. Populism that divides us into the real people and the non-people. Populism that requires a permanent enemy. Each in their own way is stoking fear and suspicion, promising to return people to a more certain golden age, somewhere in a past that never really existed. The American writer Mark Lilla has condemned this growth of identity politics as he says, a cancer on democracy. To him, we are sacrificing the idea of what it is to share citizenship. He says this resurgence of populism is the product of what he calls the shipwrecked mind. The shipwrecked mind. It is the mind of the reactionary. It is the mind of the person turning away from change who sees, as he wrote, the debris of paradise drifting past their eyes. The shipwrecked mind is nostalgic for the glorious past lost. As Lilla writes, hopes can be disappointed. Nostalgia is irrefutable. Things were better back then. This is the world sketched by the American lawyer and academic Amy Chua in her new book, Political Tribes. Professor Chua traces how identity politics is remaking our world and has already triggered a revolution in American politics. Tribal instinct, she said, is not just an instinct to belong, it is also an instinct to exclude. The US, she says, is in a perilous new situation with nearly no one standing up for an America without identity politics, for an America that transcends and unites the identities of all of the country's subgroups. It is a threat to America's place in the world. Already, people are talking about the post-American world, which has enormous implications for all of us. And history is at the heart of identity politics. It is its very pulse. This is history as betrayal, a narrative of loss, of innocence robbed. In America, Donald Trump says he wants to make America great again, as if there is a lost America. In Russia, Vladimir Putin laments the end of the Soviet empire. In his words, the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. China's Xi Jinping speaks of the hundred years of humiliation at the hands of foreign powers to fire a sense of Chinese nationalism. Turkey's President Erdogan speaks of the lost Ottoman Empire. Nostalgia has a powerful hold. It is the most potent political force in our world today. Mark Lilla has called this the apocalyptic imagination. As he writes, the present, not the past, is a foreign country. All that was left was the memory of defeat, destruction and exile. And this in so many ways is my history. As an indigenous person, the story of invasion, dispossession, Racism, segregation, these are the stories passed down through generations of my family. I sat at the feet of my parents and heard the stories of us 
rounded up and sent to missions, of children taken away, families torn apart. It didn't happen in some dim, dark past. My mother could tell me the story of her father, chained to a tree like a dog and left in the sun all day by the police, of the police arriving at another time and putting a gun to his head while they bulldozed the tin humpy that they called home, running over the graves of three of his children who were buried there, of my father telling me about beatings that he'd taken in police cells. I was raised on these stories, painful and vivid, and they have marked me, and I felt at times marked me indelibly. History is where we locate ourselves. It is the foundation of identity, and it can be a seductive narrative. The story of our loss speaks a great truth, but it also presents a dilemma. At what point do these stories, this history, cease nourishing us and begin to poison us. It's been my struggle, it is the struggle of all of us to move beyond it. Not to ignore it or to airbrush the worst aspects, but to lift the weight of history from our shoulders. I have no desire to be bound to a history of misery, worse to revel in it. And what is history? What is truth when we seek to examine the past, what can we really tell about ourselves? Historical truth can be elusive, especially when it is filtered through memory. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche warned us to tread warily. He said, where remembrance is concerned, there are no facts, only interpretations. Memory, as we know, is unreliable and selective. And as we've seen, it can be a powerful and at times destructive political weapon. In the words of the French historian Jacques Le Goff, memory seeks to rescue the past in order to serve the present and the future. Is this the role of history? Do we seek to retrieve history to rehabilitate ourselves? Are historians moral guardians? Is it their task to redeem us? Can the actions of the past be seen through the values of today? An Australian historian, Greg Melowish, recently wrote that history is a means, an imperfect means, to understand the past, but it is not the past itself. And think about that. What, is he, what he is saying is that we reassemble a narrative, a story of the past from fragments, the shattered pieces of lives long gone. It is a delicate and forensic task like sifting through the ashes of a house fire to assemble a story of those who once lived there. It will always be incomplete. The French historian Michel de Certeau once spoke of history as a, as a story of absence, a story of loss. History was like tracing the footprints on the shore of people long gone. He says that we arrange our past like artefacts, carefully assembled in a shop front window. How do we tell the story of us? What monuments do we erect? What events do we commemorate? Which historical figures do we celebrate? How do we assemble our artefacts? These are confronting questions for Australia. History, the unresolved legacy of the past, as we are being reminded this week, lies at the very heart of reconciliation. There are calls now for a process of truth and justice. To finally end what the great Australian anthropologist Bill Stanner once called the great Australian silence. But in many ways, we have already pierced that silence. New histories are being written. They're rescuing the indigenous story from the margins. And we are confronting critical questions. How do we commemorate a figure like Captain Cook? How do we remember the frontier wars? 
Was this continent settled or invaded? Critical questions with no easy answers. In fact, we may find that all of those things sit alongside each other, that all of those things can be equally true. Most critically, how do we have this vital national discussion without tearing each other apart? How do we make this story all of it? Our story. How do we build a nation out of the pieces of the past? Ernest Renan speaks powerfully to us. Forgetting is crucial to nation building. Yet forgetting can too easily slip into denial. This year, as I said, the theme of Reconciliation Week is don't make history a mystery. History can tell us who we are, but as we are seeing throughout our world, historical grievance can so easily become a battlefield. Mm. I've written of all of this in a recent essay for the Griffith Review. And in my search for answers, I went in search of a man from another time. What would my grandfather make of our world today? What would he make of this age of hyper-identity? I doubt he ever uttered the word identity. I doubt he ever considered what it meant to identify with anything. <laughs> Cecil William Henry Grant was an Aboriginal man. He would have said a Wiradjuri man. He lived among Wiradjuri people. He married a Wiradjuri woman and raised his children to know what it was to be a Wiradjuri person. He was also an Australian, and proudly so, defiantly Australian at a time when Australia was telling him that he wasn't. When war came, he signed up, a rat of Tobruk. My grandfather fought not to prove his worth, but because he already believed himself worthy. He came back and he told his children of the world that he'd seen. He told them that this world was their world and that no one could shrink their horizons but themselves. He was a Christian, his faith founded in a belief in justice and equality. As so many of the original Aboriginal political pioneers were, who emerged out of those missions with a strong belief in their faith and the sure belief in justice that that gave them. He would have heard that same message in the words of a black preacher from the segregated South of America, who dreamed of a day when we would be judged not by our color, but by our character. When I think of Martin Luther King Jr., I think of everything my grandfather was. Yes, he was Aboriginal. That was who he was to the core of his being. It was his heritage, it was his family. To be Aboriginal was as natural as breathing. But it wasn't all he was. Like the great majority of our people, he was what today we clumsily call mixed race. He had an Irish grandfather. He found a world beyond his own in books and a love of knowledge. He wrote short stories and poems I'm told he kept by his bed the works of Shakespeare and the writings of our own bards, Lawson and Patterson. My father still has my grandfather's old Bible with his handwritten notes inside, nearly half a century since the old man passed away. My grandfather lived the words of the ancient Roman playwright Terence, a man himself bought and sold as a slave who said, I am human. Nothing that is human is alien to me. My grandfather was a man of courage and sacrifice, a man born on the margins of Australia who endured harsh poverty, bigotry and state-enforced discrimination but never wavered in his dignity or his hope for this country, a man locked out who looked for a way in. In 1966, toward the end of his life, my grandfather nominated as a candidate to be elected as the Aboriginal representative of the Aborigines Welfare Board. This was the organisation that 
had so much control over our lives. And I found his campaign pitch in an old edition of the Welfare Board magazine, Dawn. It was distributed to Aboriginal communities across New South Wales. It is an extraordinary document to read. A document that speaks of an unflinching belief in basic human dignity. When I read those words now, I can hear him speak them. He said, anyone claiming that Aborigines are not humanly equal to other people seems to lack the knowledge of the common ingredients of which all human beings are made. All mankind is blessed or plagued with egoism, irrespective of the pigmentation of the skin, subject to the influences of the elements of physical, natural and divine influences. All these things, he wrote, are evident in men. Thus far, he said, we are humanly equal and should be regarded by all as such. Today, those words can seem almost quaint. They're so at odds with the spirit of our times. These are angry times. While he campaigned for equality and justice today, throughout our world, we're just as likely to hear more about resentment and vengeance. He fought for inclusion and today we so often hear about exclusion, us and them. We are more likely to define ourselves by what we are not, who we are against, rather than what we share in common. This Reconciliation Week, as we look again to our history, we need to ponder its place in making a nation. Nation building is at the heart of reconciliation. It's what we have seen on stage today. It's why all of you are here, in all of your diversity, to make this a nation. And we should look again to the words of Ernest Renan from a time of revolution in France and how they speak to us. Man is a slave, he said, neither of his race his language, his religion, the course of his rivers, nor the direction of his mountain ranges. A great aggregation of people, insane mind and warm heart, have created a moral conscience that calls itself a nation. Thank you so much.